of Acts, chapter 4, verses 23 to 35. Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 35. And let's read these verses responsibly. Uh, chapter 4, 23 to 35. It's a little bit lengthy, but it's a story, so I want us to really get the, the flow of the story here. Uh, chapter 4, verse 23. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And it reads, When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And then when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, among, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever you hand and your plan had destined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had, had, when they had prayed, the, pe the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had something in common. And with that great power, the apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and bought the proceeds of what was sold together and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Amen. Now, I really want to be led by the Holy Spirit. What about you? Do you really, really want to be led by the Holy Spirit? Amen. That's a question then. I'm expecting an answer, so if you could answer, it would help the conversation here. Um, you know, I see people these days, it's a trend, I guess, people have a bucket list. They have these hundred things or ten things they want to experience before they die. Uh, so, kind of random question, but James, what's number one on your bucket list? Before you die, you want to do this, you know? What is, is there something on your list? That... <laughs> well, that's a very extreme experience, yes. <laughs> very important one, too. <laughs> Some of us have never experienced that. So, you know, uh, we want as many joyful experiences and wonderful, you know, encounters as much as possible as we enjoy life on this earth. But if uh, they knew, if the people out there knew the joy of being led by the Spirit of God, they would not exchange it for anything else. No, nothing on their bucket list could compare to the experience of being led by the Spirit of God. And so we are going back to the Bible to truly experience the leading of the Spirit, how the Spirit led the first disciples, the first church, and how we could be led by the Spirit of God. I believe it was George Miller, 19th century Britain, England. Uh, he uh, was saddened by the fact that many people did not believe in the power of prayer. They did not believe in the leading of the Holy Spirit. If you can re recall back in your history, world history, it was a time of enlightenment. It was a time of scientific revolutions. It was a time of industrial revolution and advancement. Logic, reason was the, the, the key term for the century. Uh, and so people, yes, went to church. They went to the Anglican church. But they did not expect God to do uh, more than what was expected in daily lives. God was some, that somebody that, that would maintain their status quo. Seeing that uh, spiritual condition, uh, George Miller, who is uh, known as a pastor of prayer, he decided to pray to God and uh, be able to testify to the people 
without him asking anybody any personal favors or any uh, asking for any money he would just commit himself to prayer and see how God takes care of his ministry as uh, we look at back look back at George Miller's life he prayed his entire life we know there are many episodes of amazing things how God took care of him in his ministry his legacy is that he left a Bible institution in the city of Bristol and he also uh, was able to furnish and provide for four orphanages, uh, 10,000 children in, in number throughout his years. And he was able to, to uh, raise $8 million, you know, in today's terms, $8 million uh, for, and to take care of all the needs for the orphanages. And when he, w when he passed away at the ni age of uh, 93, I believe, he only had $800 in his possession. He gave it all to the Lord. And we look at his life, and there is nobody among us, I believe, that would look at his life and say, what an ordinary life. It is not an ordinary life. It's nothing but ordinary. It is an extraordinary life. And it is a testimony of what God can do in a person's life as they allow themselves to be led by the Spirit of God. Brother and sister, do you thirst? Do you have that hunger to be led by the Spirit of God? Our lives would not be normal. It will always be extraordinary. Not ordinary, but extraordinary. And that uh, we can seek that leading of God. Last week, we saw the condition to be led by the Spirit of God. The condition was, in a nutshell, that uh, we had to confess Jesus Christ as our Lord. Uh, that was the condition. And uh, as an application, what that means is, we, as we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord, we need to confess our sins daily and let go of the things that Jesus is not the Lord of our lives and as we do this as we as we empty this in other words as we deny ourselves it is a condition that the Holy Spirit can start lead us he cannot lead a person who is self-centered who is led by themselves and so it was an emptying process but this morning I want to share the second part of uh, being led by the Spirit which is to be filled by the Spirit. It's not just emptying yourself and denying yourself, but it is actually the filling of the Holy Spirit. If God were to look at your hearts and my heart this morning, what is it filled with? If our hearts are filled with uh, work or the things of the world, money and all these things, the fruit of those things are concern, worries, and strife. You're tired. But on the other hand, if our hearts were to be filled with the Holy Spirit, the things of God. The Bible promises that He brings the fruit of joy, of uh, peace, of thanksgiving, and of true satisfaction. And isn't that what we want to fill our hearts with this morning? The things of the Holy Spirit. Not the things that drag us down and make us tired and bring more strife and conflict in our lives. This morning, we want to specifically focus on this theme, what happens when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. What happens? What are some things we can observe that would happen in our lives if we were to be filled, our hearts, our spirits were to be filled with the Holy Spirit and not the things of the world? And the text that we read this morning gives us two things. Two things that happen in our lives as we are filled with the Spirit of God. The first is this. The Spirit fills us with the boldness he fills us with a boldness through the Holy Scriptures. Let me say that one more time. The Holy Spirit fills us with the boldness, with boldness through His Holy Scripture. Holy Spirit, Holy Scripture, boldness. Um, look at the background. We remember that uh, 120 of the disciples were anointed by the Spirit last week on, on Pentecost Sunday. Oh. We believe it's Sunday. <laughs> and uh, uh, they received the Holy Spirit and they started speaking tongues, right? And the gathering area could not contain their voices of their speaking in tongues. So other people came and listened to them. And what's going on? And Peter used the opportunity to stand up and preach that Jesus Christ, who is risen, who you crucif crucified, has sent the Spirit to us. And so they, they wanted the Spirit as well. So they repented that day. The people who gathered repented that day and confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord. And they were baptized. And recall, 3,000 people received the Holy, same Holy Spirit that disciples, the 120 people, disciples, received that day. 
What amazing work of the Holy Spirit. The first encounter people had of the filling of the Holy Spirit. But that was just the beginning, we find out. That was just the start. There was an, a, a bigger, a greater obstacle that they had to overcome. And was Holy Spirit strong enough? Was He powerful enough to give them the boldness to overcome this obstacle? Before we come to our scripture, the immediate background is that they were summoned to this council of 71 men who were rulers of Israel, right, uh, under, under Rome. And uh, it's like the governing body, uh, the, real, really, the truly governing body, not just uh, this legal, but the, the true governing body for the people that were living there. And the Bible specifically names the people who were in that council, who were hearing the, what the disciples uh, were saying and how they were being a disturbance to the society. So they were questioning them. They were, in fact, about to judge them and sentence them. Sentence them. Uh, in uh, chapter 4, verse 6, if you have your Bibles open, I'd like you to turn over there to chapter 4, verse 6, uh, which is the uh, background to the, 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 the verses that we read this morning. And it gives us some names. I want you to listen to these names. You know these names. Verse 6 says, uh, With Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family, we recognize these names because they were the exact same priests, high priests, who judged and ruled over Jesus. When he was captured on the night, Thursday night, before he was crucified, he was brought to the same council of 71 men. This was the Jewish council, the ruling governing body of the day, of the time, of the land. And you know what? Peter and John, were, they found themselves standing in the same court after two months after Jesus died. Imagine yourself in that court. Because these are governing rulers, maybe we could liken it, liken it to senators, you know, the, the Senate in Washington, D.C. You will see the senators, you know, I don't know how many senators are there, but tens of, tens of senators are, are there. And these are you know, professional debaters. They've been de doing mock trials, debate from their youth, right? And they've been lawyers, they've been, um, you know, prosecutors and judges, and some of them have been mayors and maybe even governors. So they, they, ha they can argue. <laughs> they know, uh, you know, a lot of stuff. And you are fishermen by trade. You're standing there before them, and you're intimidated. Not only that, not the fact that they know so much more, and they're the governors of, the, of this land, but uh, they are the ones that killed your Lord two months ago. Wouldn't your knees be knocking, and you're, you're so, so weak and feeble, and you are speechless? But the response, their response was totally different from what was expected. They were so bold. And the Bible makes it clear that the boldness did not come from them. It came from uh, outside. In verse 7 of chapter 4, the Bible specifically referenced the Holy Spirit. And when they had set them in mist, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people, and, rest is, uh, and he goes into his speech. He's, he's speaking by the Holy Spirit. The so Holy Spirit was giving him the boldness and the uh, encouragement that he needed. In, in other words, he had a supernatural power working behind his, his, in his mouth. It, the Spirit was feeding him the words. And the Spirit was uh, boldening his heart to be able to stand before the same council that Jesus was tried and reason with them and to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who raised this lame man and he can walk. It's not us. It's Jesus Christ. And as you know the story, they had to let them go. The council had to let them go because it was just so apparent that something else was at, at work here. This was not the fishermen, disciples, these uh, peasants that they had known. These were bold people, something Holy Spirit was involved. And also they could see that the lame man who was always every day at the temple begging, he's walking around and people are praising God for this amazing work of God. And they, in fact, the council was speechless, so they had to let them go. And so that's where we pick up today's passage. The apostles, they came back to the church and reported, did a mission report of what had happened to them. 
25 and 20 to 28 of chapter 4 uh, gives us the detail of what they said. Uh, and um, 25 says, uh, who, this is Peter saying, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, and by the Holy Spirit. Again, he mentions the Holy Spirit. Why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? After they had given this report of what had happened to the court, they realized that the Holy Spirit was with them. They had this boldness that they had never experienced before. Of course, last week said that boldness that originated it originated from their confession of Jesus Christ as the risen Lord and Savior. But today we see another layer, a deeper layer of uh, that source of boldness for them. Yes, that is the basis for their boldness, but the bigger base for them, it was the Word of God. Because suddenly it was revealed to them, or they were reminded of a passage of scripture in the Old Testament. Psalm chapter 2 verse 1. They had read it many times in their synagogues, maybe all through their lives. Maybe they recited it because it's the second, chap second psalm of the entire book of Psalms. They read it many times. And finally, like a, a fog being lifted up, a fog now just disappearing, this made sense for the first time. Again, it says, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain, the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his anointed. The Holy Spirit suddenly reminded them of this verse and helped them to see that what was prophesied through the Holy Spirit through David was happening before their eyes. These kings, these rulers, they were, they were able to name who these were now that were against God and his Messiah, his anointed one. And look at verse 27. They, as a realization, they start with this word. Say, they say, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. The people of the council were plotting against God's anointed. Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of Judea. And Herod, you know, who was the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great also tried to kill Jesus, baby Jesus. Now his son also uh, persecuted Jesus in a, in a kangaroo court, in a really funny court. And the disciples saw this as what it was. It was the nations, the kings, the rulers going against God and his Messiah. And so when they realized this, it, the two-dimensional, you know, 2D letters of the word, it became 3D. It popped up from the scripture. And the Holy Spirit gave them the realization that they were living out this prophecy. And so how did they pray as a result of this realization? And so verse 29, um, sorry, verse 28 it says, to do whatever your hand and your plan had pre predestined to take place. They realized that all this, this going against Jesus and persecuting was actually in the device, in the planning of God all along. And, and so they were not afraid. And they said, in the Holy Spirit, they prayed this. And now, 29, Lord, look upon these threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your words with all boldness. Give us your miracles and signs, but help us to not keep our mouths shut, but continue to share Jesus Christ is the Messiah, is the Christ, with all, with boldness. They were able to pray what the Holy Spirit wanted them to pray. When they realized that the scripture was coming alive in, that, in their time, and the Holy Spirit was, was revealing the meaning of this, and they were right in the center of it, they started to pray along with the Holy Spirit, to give them the boldness and strength and courage to continue to witness that Jesus is Christ. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit gives us the conviction and confidence through His Holy Scripture and to be bold to do His work. And as a result, as a sign maybe from God that God will indeed grant this, He shakes the ground, right? As have you uh, experienced uh, the shaking last week? You know, there was a small earthquake uh, near in the East Bay, I believe. Um, my wife called me, said, did you feel it? I was at church. I didn't feel anything. But uh, it's like five point something over in the East Bay. 
I forget where it was. Maybe you felt it. Uh, you know, but a real physical earthquake, a, a, a tremor was there to affirm that God heard their prayer as a church. This church was praying to God, and they were affirming what God was doing in Psalm chapter 2 to the Holy Spirit, and God blessed them. And also, let's look at this, 31 says specifically, and when they had prayed, the place in which they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Exactly what they had prayed for. When they were led by the Spirit, they were able to see what the Scripture meant. And when they were seeing the Scripture living, being lived out in their midst, they became bold uh, by the Spirit to continue on the work of God. If you were a disciple, we were disciples, I, I might have said this, you know, after coming back from the council, I said, you know, we need to change our strategy. They find, found out who we were. And they found out that we are Jesus' followers and they could come in and attack us anytime, any moment. But when they realized this was the doing of the Holy Spirit, that the scripture was being fulfilled, they become emboldened and they ask God to give them the strength to continue on this message of God. Yes, we see when the disciples were filled with the Spirit, they, were, they had the confidence and boldness to do God's work work. Even though it was the council that killed their very Lord and Savior, they were able to withstand the pressure and uh, speak the truth, speak the real truth to them. You know, you might think, you know, people when they get drunk or maybe they're addicted to drugs, they could be emboldened. Or maybe they hear a, a good speech, an encouragement from somebody, and they could be temporarily bold and encouraged to do something. But this whole church Peter and John, who are fishermen, to be boldened like this, emboldened to pray to the Spirit to help us continue witnessing Jesus Christ despite all the threats. It was an outside source that helped them. It was the Holy Spirit that gave them the power to continue on. A boldness that, that the Holy Spirit gives through the Holy Scripture was what they needed. When we, only have, when we have that boldness of the scripture, we find out that God is speaking to me this morning and God is showing me things about our lives. You want, you want to obey him. You want to follow him. You want to see where that leads to. And that's exactly what the disciples did. You see, uh, the boldness of the spirit comes through the word of God. Your, as your heart is filled, as your heart is filled with the word of God, you hear his word and you confirm his word in your life, you become emboldened to do his work. You know, during the week, uh, past week, I had things that distressed me, and uh, there are situations I pray for, and I became sad because uh, I was praying for a certain situation to change. Uh, but I was reading Ezekiel in our bulletin, actually. As I was reading Ezekiel, I, uh, this, this word of God really captivated my attention. It was the part where it said, Jerusalem had to fall. It was destined. Their sin was up to here. And so there was no remedy. God was going to punish them. And Ezekiel had to proclaim that punishment continually to Jerusalem and to the people who are even right now captivated by the Babylonians. As I saw this, Jerusalem has to fall. But I find myself, I'm holding on to this Jerusalem. I'm asking God, God, would you heal this Jerusalem? Would you release this Jerusalem from this difficult situation? Would you change the situation? And I realize that Jerusalem has to fall sometimes for God to bring true repentance and healing in that land. And I realized Holy Spirit was speaking this to me. I let it go. I said, God, this is your city. This is not mine. I've been holding on to this. It was wrong. I repent. I want you to take control. Doesn't mean that situation and circumstance changed this past week, but a strange change did happen in my heart. It gave me freedom. I realized that Jerusalem is not mine. It's His from the first place. And I let go. I said, God, you do what you have to do. I'm only your mouthpiece. I will obey. I will follow. And He gives us renewed strength to continue on the ministry, the work of God that He has called me to do. Brothers and sisters, do you really want the, full, the filling of the Holy Spirit? 
Do you truly desire the filling of the Holy Spirit? Let us fill our hearts with the Word of God every morning so that He can stir our hearts up with that Word and remind us and help us to see what He wants to say to us. And we can obey and we have that when we realize the Holy Spirit has spoken to us through the Scripture, you and I will have the boldness and confidence that nothing else in this world can give. Let us fill our hearts with the, Spirit, the Scripture of God. Second, what happens when the Holy Spirit fills our lives? Second it is, is this. Holy Spirit fills us with the generosity, with the generosity for one another. He fills us with the generosity for one another. Uh, after the filling of the spirits that we read this morning, 32 to 35 is like an epilogue of what happened to the church. Look at this. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart, soul, and no one said that any of these things that belonged to them was his own, but they had everything in common. And then it goes on, uh, verse 33, apostles were preaching and great grace was upon them. What is grace? Grace is, is the church word. Originally, it's not a church word. We use it so much, grace, grace, enough, grace is enough, and all that. But it just simply means a gift. They realized that they had received so much from the Lord that uh, their hearts were open. They were just free of the, 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 the fear of losing stuff. And they were able to just uh, uh, share the, everything with their community willingly in their lives. And great Spirit of God, the filling of the Spirit re leads to great generosity in a holy community of God. And they start to share their things in the grace of the Lord. The important thing is that they did it voluntarily. If you read on, we find that uh, they gave according to the needs of the needy. What a perfect community and society. But they did it voluntarily, willingly. If, uh, you know, I were to say, since we're a church, we're a Holy Spirit-led church, we need to give for the needy, we need to do this, that will turn, gradually turn into what we call socialism or communism. And in fact, history has tried to emulate this in society on a bigger scale, and they come up with this failed system. And uh, many have suffered. The key point is that when the Holy Spirit gave that gift, when they realized that the Holy Spirit was more than enough for what, anything that they needed, they gave voluntarily, willingly, lavishingly, generously for one another, for the work of God. Only when the, the Holy Spirit is filled in the community of God can we see such a beautiful communal living among people of God. You know, uh, tonight my daughter will go to Korea by herself. Um, first time, you know, kind of scary. More for me <laughs> than for her. Uh, and, uh, you know, I uh, was contemplating which luggage, which bag I was going to give her, right? You know, she might lose it. She's a, you know, teenager and, you know, how careless they are. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, kids are kids. And uh, we contemplated, but I decided with my generous heart, to give her my best luggage, you know, most expensive luggage. You might think, oh, that's not so expensive, but for me, it's like, you know, number one treasure. <laughs> I'm not luggage in my home, which I don't have much of, but, you know, I decided to give her the best. And uh, you might praise me, well, what a great dad you are. Would you do that? Say, so, you know, I would do that too, <laughs> you might say. You know, to, to show how generous and gracious I am to my daughter, I even have this thought. You know, as a teenager, she can damage the bag, or maybe she might lose it. And when she comes back, I decided not to claim you know, money for that. I decided to just forgive her already in my heart, even though nothing has happened. You know, am I being generous? No. As parents, all of you would have done the same because they are your family and you love them and you would give everything and anything for your family member. The disciples, when the church, when they realized that this was their spiritual family, there was one figure, the head was Jesus Christ. And they all confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. When the Holy Spirit opened that eyes, those eyes for them in their hearts, suddenly it didn't matter, you know, what they had, what they didn't have. They just start to share anything and everything that they had. This can happen in a communal setting. 
as well, not just in your homes or in your families. You know, every year I go to a mission trip, I always remember to bring a rain jacket. And that's uh, one of the things that on our manual, you know, bring your rain jacket because you know, I know when it's going to rain. Uh, so I even message my team members, you need to bring your rain jacket just in case. So uh, I, did, I brought mine every year, but for some reason, I forgot to bring my rain jacket. And uh, Sunday comes, you know, like after two days after we arrived there, and it was pouring and raining like crazy. I've never seen so much rain in my life. Uh, I, we were in the sanctuary, and we couldn't talk, converse, because the rain was hitting the, the roof so hard, and it was just such a big rain. And in the afternoon, about an hour later, the, the, the streets were flooded with water, you know, with all the heavy rain. And after the rain subsided a little bit, it was our time to go in the streets and to do the prayer walk. But guess who doesn't have a raincoat, rain jacket? You know, it was still drizzling a little bit, so uh, I was uh, concerned a little bit. That was then when one of our members looked at me and said, uh, do you need a rain jacket? And yes, actually I do. And he says, actually I have 10 here, would you like one? Why do you have 10 rain jackets on a mission trip? There's so much to carry. He says he brought them just in case somebody might need it. And I looked at him, I saw him with, he was filled with the Spirit in my eyes. He was so generous. He had brought so many to spare for other members. And in fact, there were people who didn't bring their rain jackets and we were able to share all the jackets. It just cost $2 for, for a jacket, very, very cheap. But uh, it changed the atmosphere of our entire group to the whole mission trip. People were sharing, people, none, nobody was claiming whatever there was. It was truly, I believe, a heavenly experience. When the Holy Spirit fills our hearts with that joy that He gives us and gives us that, that freedom to let go of our stuff, we can share our stuff with the people we love, with our family members, our spiritual family members. I was so impressed by this gentleman how can we have this generosity that comes from the Holy Spirit? How can we share with the needy in our community? Um, I believe our church members are, many people are very good at this. And even, uh, you know, you all, uh, you know, share your food and your snacks after service. And you don't get any recognition, but you do that for the, from your generous heart. And it generates more generosity within the church. People give for heritage home. People, uh, I know, but you guys don't know that uh, some people, they, they see the need, they secretly support them, uh, you know, with their generous gift. And all these things are the work of the Holy Spirit. I want to go a little bit further. How can we experience this generosity of the Spirit-filled church? Um, I brought with me a, a glass here, just to illustrate. And... Uh, milk from this morning. It's so cold. Anybody thirsty? I'm serious. I'm going to give you this milk if you really want it. It's fresh. <laughs> so let's uh, pretend that this is, oops. Yeah, this is you. Yeah, all white. And uh, fresh. Let me get this uh, napkin. And as a, a Christ follower, you know, uh, you have been purified and cleansed, but uh, you receive the Holy Spirit. This is, uh, you're not supposed to drink this, right? I'm not supposed to, but some of you can. Chocolate syrup. So, uh, Holy Spirit is in your heart. Like that. More? <laughs> More, James? <laughs> the Holy Spirit is in your heart. But you know what? Do you see a change? It's... It's there, but you can't really see any difference in your life. Maybe you don't feel the Holy Spirit in your life. But when you stir it up, like this. Did I put too much? It changes the entire milk into a delicious, heavenly taste. Uh, chocolate milk. I believe it takes a stir. Somebody that stirs up. The generosity. Somebody that starts the generosity within the church. We all have the Holy Spirit. We all have the potential. We all have the power to give. And the Holy Spirit 
loves it. He is pleased when we share our needs with our share with the needy, our brothers and sisters. But it takes one stir. You need somebody to start that generosity. In our passage of scripture, it's not explicitly said in this passage this morning, but if you look at the next verse, there is a specific name mentioned. One name that's mentioned that was the most generous person. And that was, his name was Joseph of, uh, or Barnabas. Barnabas of Cyprus, the island of Cyprus. This is the way, the, the Bible's way of honoring this name. And what did this person do? It says, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the disciples' feet. Barnabas was the person who he stirred. He, he, because he was stirred by the Holy Spirit and he gave generously to the work of God. And we go back to verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were in one heart, one soul. And no one said that any of these things that belonged to him was their own. But they had everything in common. And they, there was no people, no person that was needy in the community of God. This is what the Holy Spirit does. Oh, by the way, James, go ahead, take it. <laughs> Finish it. <laughs> and see what it tastes like. Did I put enough? <laughs> the Holy Spirit is the one who become, gives the, is the first generous giver and when we obey that one uh, obedience to our Lord he changes the entire community he stirs up the entire community for love and good deeds maybe that's why uh, Hebrews chapter 10 24 says that uh, stir up you know spur up spur on love and good deeds as we see the last day coming Yes, the Holy Spirit wants to lead us into his wonderful godly work and to give generously to the people around us. Would you be that one person, that Barnabas, that stirs up good deeds? doesn't take much for that gentleman in um, my mission trip. It, took him, it cost him $10 to, uh, to buy all the raincoats. And as we uh, go to our Lord this morning, let us pray that our hearts will be filled with the Holy Spirit to be filled with the Word of God, boldness of the Word of God, and to be filled with the generosity that Holy Spirit can give us. So you and I could be the stirs, the starters for the generous community of God that God wants us to be. Let's pray. As we bow our